Well, good morning, Spotswood. My name is Tyler, and it's so good to be with you again. Hey, the Easter holiday may be behind us, but as someone reminded me just last week, every day is Easter. Jesus is still alive, and so is hope, and for that reason, we're excited to be worshiping with you this morning. Lots of opportunities on the horizon to connect and grow here at Spotswood, so here are your announcements. Well, if you've been wondering what missions partnerships look like here at Spotswood and how you can get involved, this is a great morning for you. Because out in our lobby, you'll be able to talk with our various missions teams who can tell you about the partnerships, how you can be praying, and potentially how you can even go on an upcoming trip. If you'd like to be involved with one of our most effective local missions outreaches, we invite you to stop by and talk to Ann Johnson about serving with Vacation Bible School. If that's you, if you've already signed up or if you're signing up today, you're not going to want to miss a very important training happening next week over in the student building at 1215. Well, it's no secret here at Spotswood, we love our city. So every once in a while for our monthly night of prayer, we mix it up and we head downtown for a special night together. That's happening tonight at 6 p.m. Join us, you and your family, out at Hurt Camp Park at the Love Sign. We'll be worshiping and praying there together and then scattering into groups to pray for specific needs in our city. We'd love for everyone to wear a Love Fredericksburg shirt if you have one and then go grab dinner and ice cream together. It's gonna be a great time. We'll see you there. Finally, speaking of missions, ladies, you will not want to miss out on Bon Voyage, a very special spring event happening on April the 12th. This is going to be an evening of desserts, fellowship, and fun where you get to learn all about these mission partnerships that we've been talking about. April Bun, we're very excited, is going to be your guest speaker from the International Mission Board. Cost will be $20, but a portion of that is going to go to college students who are headed to Guinea, West Africa in the coming year. Well, church, thanks again for being with us this morning. If you came ready to give, we have a number of easy and safe ways for you to do that. If you're here in person with us, you can drop your gift in a box near your exit on the way out, or you can set up a one-time or recurring gift through our app or at sponsor.org slash give. We'd also love for you to stay as connected with us all week long as you are right now. You can do that at sponsor.org and on Facebook and Instagram at Spotswood News. We love you, church. God bless. Good morning, church family. Let's stand. Let's worship together. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you That's your testimony, sing it out this morning I was breathing but not Alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my turn till I met you. You called my name. Yes, yeah. 
rescue this morning. Every one of us does. Sing this out to him. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I
Father God, no one is worthy except you to receive the kind of praise that you deserve. Only you, King Jesus, sovereign over all creation, our King. We serve you, we minister to you this morning. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is our God. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray and sing. Amen. Church, you may be seated. We get the opportunity this morning to witness baptism. Pastor Dakota? All right. So we have two baptisms of two of our high school students this morning. I'm really, really excited about it. Uh, and before they come down, I just want to remind you that uh, there's nothing magic about the water. Um, it's nice and warm, but it is not washing sins away or anything like that. Jesus already did that. And they are coming today to tell you, the church, that Jesus has changed them and they are gonna pursue him with their life. So first we have Kenneth, come on down, Kenneth. So Kenneth has a really cool story. Um, it's too long to tell the whole thing, but the, the, the cliff notes are that, you know, he, he was connected with one of our other students, Will, who's actually back here right now to support Kenneth, which is really cool. And Will uh, presented the gospel to Kenneth. A lot of times I tell you that I sat down with a student and walked them through this. I didn't sit down with Kenneth and walk him through the gospel. One of his friends did in high school. Um, and through that, uh, he gave his life to Jesus and then we met just the other day to talk about baptism. So, Kenneth, has Jesus saved you and are you committed to living your life for him and following his lead? Yes. Awesome. Because of that, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And next up, we have Abby. So I'm super excited about Abby. Come on down. So Abby has done a lot with our student ministry. Abby's very popular. Um, Abby serves in our worship team as well, uh, so you probably see her up on stage a lot. Um, but she came and talked with me the other day, and she was baptized when she was younger, um, after she got saved at VBS, which is awesome. Uh, but she came and was just under the understanding that she didn't really know what she was proclaiming. She, she knew that she was saved, but she didn't know why she was really getting baptized at that moment. And she wants to now, as a follower of Jesus, make sure that she is proclaiming to everyone that she knows Jesus, which is really, really cool. So Abby, is Jesus your savior and are you committed to following him for the rest of your life? Awesome, because of that, I baptize you in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, church. Amen, amen and amen. John 1 says this, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Every person in this room um, has some sort of season, something that you're in. And you've probably heard me say this many times before. Some of you may be on a mountaintop. Some of you may be in a valley. Some of you may be in between. But I know this. Whether we're ascending a mountain or descending a mountain, whether we're in a rock bottom state of life, we cannot see without light. You have to have light. If we cut every light out in this room, covered up the stained glass windows, covered everything, and it were pitch black dark in here, no one would be able to move in any direction without potentially harming themselves. No one would be able to move in any direction without potentially harming someone else. You need light to function. You need it. 
But we have good news here that Jesus, the Word, and He is the Word, in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Whether you know it or not, you need Jesus to function. You need Him in every single decision that you need to make. You need Him in every single step that you take. You need Him in every single decision that comes your way. You need Jesus to guide you. He is your light. Pray with me, church. Father, you are good and your mercy endures forever. It never changes, it never wavers. You sent your son Jesus to die a sinner's death on our behalf so that we can truly have access to the light that is described here in John 1. God, I pray for every person that is within earshot of my voice, whether they be online or whether they be here in this room, whether they're in the, the atrium out front, wherever they are, if they can hear me, Lord, I pray that today they will recognize the need for you in their life. I pray that they understand that they need you in every decision, every step, everything that could possibly come their way. They need you. For, Lord, our world did not begin without you. You were in the beginning, and all things were made through you. And without you, nothing was made that was made. It's all you. You are the reason why it happens and functions and rotates and moves. You. So, Lord, this morning, not to us be any kind of glory. Not to us be any kind of praise. But only to the King of kings be all glory, honor, and praise. For you are worthy of it all. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Church, stand, let's continue worshiping together. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation. Now reveal. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus.
God, you are powerful, you are wonderful, you are beautiful. You are all the things described in that song. Father, I want to pray for Pastor Drew as he is coming up. I pray that you give him the words to speak. God, I pray that you reveal your truth to us. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Church, you may be seated. If you would, take your copy of Scripture, whether it's electronic or it's something bound. If you need a Bible, there should be one uh, in the back of the pew in front of you. Uh, if you want to take that, please feel free to take it. It'll be our gift to you. It's not benefiting anyone sitting there all week long just collecting dust. What I do ask you is if you take a Bible, that you spend time reading the Bible on a daily basis. And I would point you before we start and later in the sermon to the Gospel of John. I was going to pick back up today on our study of David, uh, but I, I just really felt compelled uh, to finish out the Gospel of Luke with you and to focus again on a king like no other king. So we're going to be in Luke 24, an event uh, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, probably familiar to do to you, certainly one that's familiar to me. Let me encourage you and affirm you before we go any further. Every uh, Easter, we receive an additional love offering uh, for church planting in North America. We cooperate with about 45 other Southern Baptist churches. Uh, we have been doing this Annie Armstrong Easter offering for decades, for probably over 100 years and the great thing about it now is church planting. It, it goes to, to, to care for somebody, take care of whatever their needs are, living arrangements, insurance, you name it, so that they can do what God has called them to do. That takes about $60,000 on average for a church planter to do what God's called them to do somewhere in North America. It might be in Newfoundland where some of our teenagers were recently. It could be out west, somewhere further north, or down in the deep south. This year, you gave over $64,000 through that Annie Armstrong Easter offering. So I want to affirm you. Uh, I want to encourage you. None of that stays here, okay? Uh, all of that goes to our uh, National North American Mission Board. Their office is down in Alfred of Georgia. None of it stays there. It goes to take care of the needs of missionaries somewhere in North America. Also tonight, don't forget, first Sunday, you heard it from Tyler in the announcements, is our first Sunday night of prayer off the campus in the community, Her Camp Park. We're meeting in the city of Fredericksburg. We're going to pray for our city. So I want to encourage you to be there. We'll do a little worship time, divide up in groups, and pray for specific needs in specific areas. Then afterwards, Dr. Dan is treating all of us to ice cream at Blue Cow. Isn't that cool? Yeah, he's not in this service, so he'll figure it out later. Um, the only thing is, if you see him pull out a purple credit card, that's the church credit card. So tell him, ah, he can't use that one. Uh, he can't use that one. He'll have to use cash or something. I think that's a great idea. Who do you talk to in life when your life doesn't go the way you expected it to go? What do you do when you're discouraged? What, what, what happens when you're, you're trying to, to process events, circumstances, situations, and, and, and trying to process events, circumstances, situations, you just get more and more confused, and you're pretty much ready to quit. Every person in this room and, and everyone joining us online, we've thought about giving up. We've been overwhelmed. I know I have. Been at that place where nothing seems to make sense and you just don't understand. And for some reason, you start feeling hopeless and discouraged. And I don't know if you know this or not, but hopeless and discouraged, those are attitudes, those are emotions that are extremely contagious. Now, Luke 24 None of us in the room have been through what these men were going through. But all of us have been through something. Maybe you're still in something. Could be that circumstances of your life 
are going to change this coming week and you will find yourself in something you never thought you'd find yourself in. Well, you do. It's been a while since I surfaced this. You may be new to Spotswood or, or maybe you just forgot. But I want to talk about a biblical worldview before I jump into our text this morning in Luke 24. Every person in this room, every person online, every person you know, live next to, work with, go to school with, has a world view. And you process life through your world view. And, and the best, most succinct explanation of a biblical worldview I've ever read comes from George Barna in his book, Think Like Jesus. That book's been out for quite some time. But these four words, I believe, help us grasp what a biblical worldview is. Every one of us in this room, we need a foundation, we need a focus, we need a filter, and we need faith. Foundation, focus, filter, and faith. You might want to take a picture of that, you might want to jot it down. You, you may have heard that before and you think it's, he's mentioned this before, but like, you know, stop talking because you didn't write it down the first time, so write it down this time because you're going to need this. So Somebody you know needs this. Remember, Jesus, his very first sermon made it clear that every one of us in life, we build on some type of foundation. And it's either something that's strong, it's going to hold us to the storms of life, or it's like sand. It looked good, it was easy, but when the storms hit, man, everything just fell apart. You're going to need something to focus on in life. And I think the focus of our life should be the will of God. Now, I've tried to lose that prepositional phrase, the will of God for my life. I believe God has a will, and we're making course corrections. Sometimes they're minor, and sometimes they are major course corrections corrections, to be consistent with God's will in the way we live our lives. I've said so many times, especially when I preach and teach on money in February, you need a filter. We, we have a filter in our lives, a giving filter, but you need a filter for every aspect of your life. What that does, it determines, or maybe I should say it predetermines what gets through and what doesn't get through. And I promise you, if you don't have a filter, Everything is getting through. And that's, that's detrimental to maturation as a follower of Jesus Christ. You have to have a filter. And, and, and then your, your faith doesn't fail you in those seasons that you are trying to process life and you can't figure out. You're discouraged. And you're around people. You ever notice you usually hang around people who are like you are becoming like you, and that same is true. The people you hang around with, you're eventually going to become like those people. So if you hang around people who are discouraged and hopeless, guess where you're headed? You got to have that in life. You got to have a foundation. God's will, that's the focus. There's some stuff out in our world that just doesn't need to get into our lives, into our minds because they're not good for our faith. Now, I'm going to read a rather lengthy passage this morning. It's narrative. It's a story. We need to remember God is writing a story, and he's put you in the story. You are not the author of your story. Your story does not revolve around you, whether you're a follower of Jesus Christ or not. For those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, we need to remind ourselves often that Jesus is the hero of the story and keeps us focused. So here we go. Luke 24, verse 13. And before I jump in, pay close attention to the people that God puts in your life. Pay close attention to the people around you. And so to the circumstances and the events and the situations and the challenges that you're faced with, usually what happens is our focus becomes the challenges, the circumstances, the situations, and the difficulties, and we forget about all of these people that God's put in our lives. 
Verse 13 starts out with that word, behold. That's my favorite Bible word. Y'all know that. It basically means what's coming next is really important, so you need to focus so you don't miss what's coming next. Behold. There were two men who were going that very day, this is Crucifixion Resurrection Sunday, to a village named Emmaus that was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now, your copy may say eight. You may have heard other people teaching don't get caught up in the minutia and miss the message. There are a couple things in here that we're just not going to understand. But the big rocks are pretty clear when it comes to our understanding. Seven, eight miles from Jerusalem really doesn't matter how far. They were talking with each other about the things that had taken place. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached them and he began traveling with them. Now, their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Why? I, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking part of it had to do with the resurrection. You know, resurrections were not commonplace in Jesus' day. Usually when you died, you died, kind of like today. So there was no expectation to see Jesus. I think that would be one clue. So Jesus said to them, what are the words that you're exchanging with one another while you're walking? And for some reason, after I made the change and really focused on Luke 24 for this morning, that next statement, it just hit me and stood with me and held on to me. I, I could not let go. They stood still looking Tomb's empty. Jesus is right there with them. But, but for some reason, because of the circumstances and situations, the events, they're discouraged. And, and, and they're just hopeless, and they're feeding off of that. How do I know that? Here, listen what Cleophas says. Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem unaware of the things that have happened in these days. <laughs> Do you love Jesus? And Jesus said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things about Jesus the Nazarene who was a prophet. Circle that, highlight it, problem. I'll cover that in just a second. We spent the last three weeks leading up to last Sunday, Easter, focusing on the fact that Jesus is revealed on the pages, especially in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Gospels, as king, prophet, and priest. Remember, a priest represents God to man and man to God, and from that passage that we read in 1 Timothy last Sunday, the priest is your mediator. There's one God, and there's one mediator who can get us to God, and that is Christ Jesus. So there's a whole lot more to Jesus than Jesus the Nazarene, the prophet. Mighty in deeds, word, the sight of God and all the people, how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping, remember they were a few minutes ago standing still, just kind of looking sad. Now verse 21, we were hoping. Hoping what? That it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides this, it's the third day since these things happened, and some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning. They did not find his body, and they came saying that they had seen this vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb. They found it exactly as the women said, but they didn't see him. And Jesus said to them, O oh, foolish men, slow of heart, to believe in all the prophets have spoken. All right, that phrase, believe in, circle it, highlight it, type it somewhere if you're doing something electronic. It's critical for your understanding of this story, this event in the lives of these men. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory? So, beginning with Moses and the prophets, that's the Old Testament, he explained to them all things concerning himself in the scriptures. And as they approached the village where they were going, he acted as though he was going further. But they urged him, saying, stay with us. Circle, highlight, underline, critical. 
They said, hey, it's getting late. The day's almost over. So Jesus went in to stay with them. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and breaking it, he began to give it to them. That's not the Lord's Supper. Don't get confused here. That's out of the context of the chapter. And for some reason, at this moment, verse 31, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. I don't have explanation there. I'm just reading the story. And they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us? When he was speaking to us on the road, how, was he, how he was explaining the scriptures? So they got up at that very hour, and they returned to Jerusalem, seven, eight miles. They, that's, they walked everywhere in those days. And what had taken place was too important to put off until later or to put on to someone else. So they got up, and they knew where to go. They found the disciples gathered with the 11 and those who were with them, and they were saying... I don't think they just walked in and said, oh, hey, guys, Jesus, we saw him. I don't think that's what. They were saying, the Lord really has risen. And I think they were repeating it with some emotion and some excitement. The Lord really has. They didn't understand. There were circumstances they couldn't explain. There were difficulties that they were facing. There were events that had been the focus of their life. And then Jesus shows up. Everything changes. That phrase in verse 19, Jesus the Nazarene, the prophet. I, I don't know how you view Jesus, whether you have a relationship with Jesus or not. I want everyone, every time I have the privilege of preaching and teaching, to be sure that they have a relationship with Jesus Christ and to express that relationship in believer baptism. That's an act of obedience. But I don't know where you are on the person of Jesus, but as I said last Sunday, Sunday before, if you humanize Jesus, he's just Jesus the Nazarene who tells you stories about God. If you humanize Jesus, it's easy to dismiss Jesus. It's easy to live your life thinking that Jesus really doesn't understand what I'm going through. It's easy to wake up and think that Jesus is not all that interested in you. Nothing could be further from the truth. The way Jesus is revealed in Scripture and the way he's revealed in this story. Verse 21, you know, man, we were just kind of hoping. We were hoping. At some point in life, I don't know if it has happened to you yet, but it will happen to you. At some point in life, you are going to have a theological crisis. You will have to determine for yourself that Jesus is who this book says he is, or Jesus is just this guy who lived in Nazareth a long time ago, and he said good things about God, and after he'd been crucified, they couldn't find his body. Big deal. Because after all, all religions lead to God. It's your culture. It's my culture. So, so what we have to do is unpack the truth from this story, from God's word, and understand that Jesus is more than a prophet. Jesus is more than just Jesus from Nazareth. So if, if you're dealing with that theological crisis, or if it hasn't happened yet, the best time to prepare for a crisis is before it happens. Let me give you three questions to ask that can be answered from this story in Luke chapter 24. First question, if you're experiencing theological crisis or if you're getting ready for that theological crisis or you know someone who's there, here's the first question that you should ask yourself. What am I missing about the person of Jesus? Because these guys missed it. And their response in this conversation makes it clear they missed it. So how can I help you keep from missing it when it comes to Jesus? Over the years, I've pointed out places in the New Testament that you should read. You may be new to Spotswood. You may have forgotten. I don't know. But I encourage you to jot these down, especially if you're joining us online. You may not need it today, but one day you will. 
All of these are in the New Testament, and all of them are first chapters of books. Pastor Josh already mentioned one. John chapter 1. You're trying to figure out, what am I missing about the person of Jesus? Theological crisis. Read John chapter 1. Read Romans chapter 1. And if you want to stop at verse 16, not a problem because there's some application that takes place from that point forward. Verse 16, Paul writes, you know what? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God. It's the power of God, the salvation, to all who believe, to the Jew first, but also to the Greek or to the Gentiles. We're Gentiles. There's a pattern that you see in Jesus' life. There's a pattern that you see in the book of Acts in the New Testament that the gospel was shared with the Jews, and when they said, no, not interested, it went to the Gentiles. Peter did the exact same thing. Paul, whenever he went into a city, he went to the synagogue, and he went to the marketplace, the synagogue Jews, and the God-fearers, those who were thinking about becoming Jew. And in the synagogue, the marketplace, people from everywhere in the world were there. Paul had the same message. It's the power of God that leads to salvation to any person in the world. That includes you and every person you know. The gospel is the power of God. John, Romans, stop at verse 16 if you want to. Colossians chapter one. I mentioned Colossians. Your brain should immediately go Christology. What's Christology? What you need to believe about the person and work of Jesus Christ. Colossians, the the letter that Paul wrote to these believers in Colossae is filled with what you need to know about Jesus. But if you're having that theological crisis and you just want to read one chapter, Colossians 1 is great. Hebrews chapter 1, you begin to understand who Jesus Christ is there with everything that God's been doing, and then then read Revelation chapter 1. Those five chapters can help you understand what you're missing about the person of Jesus. If you have a conversation with a neighbor, friend, co-worker, someone at school, and they're challenging you on the person of Jesus Christ, give them a Bible, the one that pew rat works. And mark those chapters and ask them to read those five chapters, and then you can have a conversation. So, well, I don't believe the Bible. Your answer is, well, I do believe the Bible. Five major religions in the world, you know this, every major world religion has a holy book that guides them. So we're just doing what the world does, except our holy book's the Bible, and it leads us to the person of Jesus Christ. What am I missing about the person of Jesus? Question number two, you should ask yourself, what am I missing about the power of Jesus? When you read verse 20, verse 21, Jesus was crucified. These two men say, you know what? We were hoping, they were just standing there looking inside. We were hoping that he was going to redeem Israel. That word redeem right here is very unusual for the Gospel of Luke. Because here is the only place in the Gospel of Luke that the word redeem is used as a verb. It's describing something that took place. They use it, we just thought he was taking care of us, but when you apply it to Jesus, we're talking the world. What does the word redeem mean? Jesus was a virgin born, he lived a sinless life, he died a vicarious death crucified on the cross. He died my place and your place if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. He was buried on the third day bodily resurrection. In the last chapter, last verse of the Gospel of Luke, he ascended into heaven. And if you read the beginning of the book of Acts, we understand that Jesus is coming back visibly the exact same way. So that encapsulates the power of the person of Jesus Christ, and it grows right out of this event. It grows right out of the Gospels. And, and, and what we need to understand is when we believe what the Gospels teach us about the person and work of Jesus Christ, his power, we're commissioned to make disciples. All four Gospels and the book of Acts, we are supposed to be making disciples. When you walk in those doors in the lobby, you see on the wall what we're about here at Spotswood. We're, we're making disciples. Disciples who love God and love their neighbor. That's pretty simple. That's exactly what Scripture teaches us about our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. So don't get sidetracked on your circumstances, events, things that you don't understand, can't explain. You gotta ask yourself, theological crisis. What am I missing about the person of Jesus? What am I missing about the power of Jesus? Third, what am I missing about the promises of Jesus? 
because Jesus made some incredible promises, especially in the Gospels. That word hoping, I just can't get away from it. In this narrative, we're just hoping. But what Jesus says when he responds, verse 25, foolish men, slow of heart, I called your attention to this, to believe in. That little preposition is incredibly important. They were just kind of hoping. But Jesus said, you need to believe in. And when Jesus says believe in, he's making himself the object of their faith. We talked about this last Sunday. Your faith is only as strong as its object. So even Jesus himself, post-resurrection, says, I must be the object of your faith. Now, hang on there for just a second. Because when you make Jesus the object of your faith, what this phrase means is that from that moment throughout all eternity, Jesus has the authority to control everything about your life. I said, you dude, you just lost me. You can be miserable in life if you want to. Focusing on nothing but things you can't understand, explain circumstances that leave you miserable and confused. There's a cost for eternity. The last thing I want you to do is to sit in this room and hear an incredible message like this, is to sit in this room and wind up in hell. I, I'm here to warn you so that when you have that theological crisis, you know you need a biblical worldview and, and you've got some questions to ask yourself and you have some answers that grow right out of Scripture. There's something you need to see in verse 25. When Jesus uses that phrase, slow of heart, what he's saying is, guys, you need to engage your mind. Where, where, where are your brains? God gave you a mind incredible so that you can process mentally and begins to affect every aspect of your life. The truth about the person of Jesus Christ revealed in the pages of Scripture. And here's, the, here, here's what happens. When your mind is not engaged, you begin to drift. Three plus decades, the privilege of preaching and teaching the gospel, I have never met one person who drifted toward Jesus. It's always drifting away from Jesus. That's why I'm giving you these questions to ask. That's why I'm giving you this framework for a biblical worldview so that you can engage your mind when you experience that theological crisis in life. And maybe you already have. If not, it's coming. So I want to keep your mind engaged. Because all of us go through seasons of discouragement, difficulty, circumstances we can't figure out, explain. As long as you have life and breath, I might as well go ahead and give you the heads up. It's going to continue. It's going to continue. Because those seasons strengthen your faith. And those seasons cause you to be thankful for the people that God's put in your life. So I'm going to give you a biblical process. And if I mention biblical process, you probably already know what number one is. You got to start with the Bible. When, you, when, you're, when you're seeking to keep your mind engaged, you, you start with the Bible. And you're probably thinking, got it, Pastor, where? I already gave you where? Five chapters from five different books in the New Testament. Start there. And as Jesus approached these two men, they're feeding off the hopelessness and discouragement. Jesus brought some new information into the conversation. If you are not in a connect group here on the campus of Spotswood on Sunday morning, you need to get in a connect group. If you grew up in church, you're thinking, what is a connect group? Two words, Sunday school. Okay? Say, so why should I do that? Because you need to do life with people who are doing life facing some of the same things you're facing. But the big difference might be they're processing biblically, and you're not. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you need to be with those people. And if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, heads up. You spend time with those people, they're going to introduce you to Jesus, and you're going to follow Jesus. 
I've shared with you before other resources. Gotquestions.org is one of my favorite. I've never found anything there that I don't agree with. You got a question? You don't know where to go? Gotquestions.org, there's a little box, top left hand, type in your question. You can type in who is Jesus, see what happens, because the answers are gonna be covered with scripture. I got an app on my phone. A lot of you have an app on your phone because we're reading the Old Testament together this year as a church. Version has some phenomenal resources. Craig Rochelle, Life Church, Oklahoma, trust them. Right Now Media, that is a resource that's free to you. As someone who is a member of, or a, a regular attender here at Spotswood, say, how do I get Right Now Media? You get a free account by getting in touch with Dr. Dan's office. Just send them an email tomorrow, not during the sermon. Send them an email to Dar and say, how do I get this Right Now Media thing? And if, they don't get an an, if you don't get an answer to your email, catch me next Sunday at church, I'll give you Dr. Dan's cell phone number. If I want him to know that, I'll, t- I'll tell him. See, what I'm talking about here is discipline, okay? It's just discipline, simple discipline. Discipline creates expectation. When, when you discipline yourself to do something, you expect results. Exercising, brushing your teeth, put your clothes in the washing machine, dryer, they come out. Have y'all ever seen a washer dryer? The word and the answer is clean. Yeah. Discipline creates some type of expectation. But here's the thing. If you say, well, I have to read the Bible, something pastors that I gotta do. When it becomes like a duty that you have to do, that destroys your expectations. And if it's nothing but a duty, it's an opportunity to have a conversation with the King of kings and Lord of lords, a king like no other king, King Jesus. If it's just a duty, you won't do it. And that theological crisis may be the ruin of your life. Start with the Bible. That's how you keep your mind engaged. Second, listen, don't wait for your feelings to change. You can't just sit around discouraged, hopeless, trying to figure life out, difficult situation, you don't see your way out or through. You have to do something. You can't just sit there hoping my, 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 my feelings are going to change. I don't use the word feelings very often, and that's intentional. These guys were just standing there when Jesus asked the question, looking sad. I've said it thousands of times, your feelings are great followers, but they are terrible leaders. What what, what I want to encourage you to do is trust God when you don't feel like it. Trust God when you don't understand it. Because trusting God is asking God to change your heart. That's what trusting God is all about. And listen, You see that in the story, in this narrative. Look at verse 29. They urged Jesus to stay with them. What that word means there is they forced Jesus to stay with them. That is a massive difference from standing there. It was cold in the church today. I didn't like those songs. Nobody spoke to me. Somebody got my seat. If that's you, you need to force Jesus to stay with you. How do you do it? Get in the Word. Get in a class. Get around some people that God put in your life who are not hopeless and discouraged. Stop paying attention to all the events. All of us have events in life. You don't know all mine. You don't want to. I don't know all yours. But I look to the people because God puts people in your life that you need and they need you. That's the way it works. Number three, when when you are desperate for Jesus, desperation for Jesus leads to dependency on Jesus. Pretty clear right here in the text. 
verse 31, verse 32, Jesus just took Scripture, Old Testament, the prophets and the wisdom literature. You don't know where to read in the Bible? Read the book of Proverbs, okay? So if you miss a day, there are 31 Proverbs. A lot of months have 31 days in them. May, we just started April, didn't we? Okay, so you can read and catch up. Does April have 31 days? Okay, then find one, then just, never mind. Find one that has 31 days, and you can get some wisdom from the Word of God. It's simple. And what happens when Jesus took the Word of God and started explaining the Word of God, the time that he took in that communication, it changed things. And that's why they forced him to stay because what that did is it created some intimacy between Jesus and these two men. Time and communication creates intimacy. Judy and I have been married. We're in our 40th year right now. We spend a lot of time together. There's a lot of communication that I've had with her, she's had with me. And that time invested together, that communication that's exclusive for me and her, that develops intimacy in our relationship. That's the way it works. And if that works husband and wife, it's going to work between Jesus and you. And then verse 34 and verse 35, listen, we need people in our lives who celebrate faith in Jesus with us. A silent celebration is an oxymoron. This past Monday night, I was one of the record crowd that watched the ladies from Iowa play the ladies from LSU. Now, the ladies from Iowa won. Totally unnecessary. Come see me after the service. Blue room, I'll be there. The fans for Iowa and those ladies, they celebrated. It was an incredible celebration. I, how is it that we can come into this room, into the presence of Jesus Christ, a king like no other king, and leave as though nothing's changed? Have you ever left church hoarse because you've been celebrating and you've been shouting and you've been exalting the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? How is it we can pay average price 400 plus bucks to go to a basketball game, but we come to church and take a nap? I ain't even got started good. Where's that person that said Iowa? You ain't getting out of here, just FYI. <laughs> See that big guy sitting behind you? His name's Greg, and he's one of my good friends. <laughs> you messed up. <laughs> I, I've read it. You ought to read it. From the beginning of Luke until the end of, the Luke, of Luke, the gospel. Man, Jesus is a king like no other king. Can't miss it. Whether it's conversation, whether it's a text message, whether it's social media, however you communicate. This week, the majority of us in this room are going to write a book of 250 pages plus. If I read your book and you read my book, would anything in that book indicate that Jesus is king of our lives? If he is the king like no other king, if Jesus truly is King Jesus, then we need to communicate that Jesus, King Jesus, is king of our lives. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you for what we have in Jesus. Incredible. Forgive us. When we just kind of go through the motions, Forgive us when we let the circumstances of our lives become the focus of life. Instead of paying attention to the people that you put in our lives and new people that you bring into our lives who, as followers of Jesus Christ, have information we don't have. God, I have no doubt there are people here in this room 
walked in thinking that you, you don't understand. Walked in thinking that you're just not that all interested in them and they're gonna shuffle in, shuffle out and no big deal. If, if that's the way you walked in, that's a pretty good indication that you've never met Jesus personally. You might know some facts about him these guys gave the facts. Here's what happened. Jesus was crucified, can't find his body. But you have never believed in Jesus, given him the authority and control of your life. Today is the day. I would never stand on this platform, stand behind this lectern without giving you an opportunity to respond. Here's your opportunity. Here's the invitation. In our foyer, there's a desk called the Next Step Station. It's against the back wall. There will be pastors there, volunteers there. That's where you need to go. In fact, that's where you need to go now. You saw the baptism. It's never happened in your life. You saw the baptism. Maybe it happened. You'd have a clue what it meant. Right now, it's time to go and find somebody. So, well, I'm in the middle of the road. Don't worry about it. The people there will let you out. They'll start rejoicing with you. They might they don't even know you. These steps here, I say this all the time. No one is stopping you for coming and getting on your face before God. There's something about doing that public where you walked in and your life was a mess and some type of theological crisis. And you lay that at the feet of Jesus and you walk out changed. You can leave the same way you come, came in. That's up to you. You don't have to. Me and Judy will be over in the blue room eventually. You're new here, newish. You're in a theological crisis. That's why you're in the room. Come talk to us. Father, you visit us with your presence today. Empower. I pray that our worship has honored you. But our worship doesn't end with a song and an amen. Worship ends in the way we live our lives from today forward until we're back on this campus next Sunday. Pray, God, that we live that for the glory of King Jesus, a king like no other kings. In his powerful name I pray. Would you stand with me? Pastor Josh and the worship team are going to lead us. I gave the options as clear as I know how. Respond. Just to the lowest 
Ask you to be, yeah, go ahead. I ask you to be seated for just a second. You know, transitions a lot of time in life uh, come unanticipated, un unexpected, uh, but I believe that God always blesses obedience and faithfulness, and certainly uh, Josh and Hannah have expressed that to us, but uh, they're about to make a transition, so why don't you share that? Church, I just wanted to tell you, um, number one, how much we love you and how good you have been to the Morton family. Um, I want to share with you that God has done a mighty work in our life here, uh, but he is going to continue doing a mighty work in our life at a church called Upstate Church in uh, Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uh, a lot of people know the church uh, as First Baptist Simpsonville. Um, it's really close to Greenville. But um, I want to tell you from the bottom of our hearts um, how much you have meant to us and how you have ministered to us and cared for us well. Uh, we are leaving, a, leaving behind a second family here. We love you guys. And we are so, so grateful that God allowed us to be a part of what he's doing here at Spotswood Baptist Church. I said the same thing in the first service. Uh, whenever a transition comes like this, there's always this weird thing that people, is he mad about something? Is he upset about something? Did we, nobody did anything. We are just trying to do what God has called us to do. And we would ask you to lovingly support us in that process. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Father, I want to pray over Josh and Hannah. Uh, from the upfront position, they have and continue to model for us obedience. Lord, we love them. We're going to miss them. But we should have excitement in our lives that this is a step of obedience and a step of faith. And God, as you have gone before them, bringing them here, go before them in this new opportunity, in this new responsibility. And I have no doubt the way they have faithfully served here, they will faithfully serve their exalting Jesus. Give them friends. I know they'll be back with family, but give them friends who will love them well. God, little Greer's growing up way too fast. Give her friends that will be lifelong friends for her as they serve Upstate Church. God, I, I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you're probably wondering what's going to happen. Hey, we have some phenomenal musicians here at Spotswood. You guys know that. Uh, Anthony, who was on the drums today, he's an associate here. Uh, somebody had a conversation with him, and one or two other volunteers. Uh, we'll, it'll be different for a little while, and I will actually know that it's different too, so you don't have to mention that. Uh, it'll just be different for a little while. Uh, we have already started the search process, so as soon as Josh and I had that conversation a month and a half ago, um, it was on my birthday <laughs> a month and a half ago. That process kicked in. Josh has been a great help in that. So I don't know how long it'll take. I'd like for, be, for it to be over like this afternoon, but that's usually not how it works. So continue to pray for Josh and Hannah. They'll be out next weekend for a wedding. Uh, the 21st will be their last Sunday here with us uh, at Spotswood. So Godspeed to you, and I know God's going to use you all in an incredible way there in Simpsonville. Now, me and Judy need to make it to the Blue Room. When I asked him to count a couple of weeks ago, that shouldn't be that hard, but he messed that up, all right? So I'm going to ask you to do that. It's like one Mississippi and two Mississippi. If you don't know where the blue room is, it's like right over there. You can't miss it. There'll be a beautiful lady in there in a black and white dress and an old ball guy. Y'all figure that one out. So you can start counting now. It's like one Mississippi. When you hit five, you can leave. 